Hello, welcome to Psych 105, Introduction to Psychology. Uh, today we will be covering intelligence, language, and learning, or ILIN as I like to call it. So let's start off with the idea of what is thinking. Thinking means paying attention to information, reasoning about it, and making judgments and decisions about it. Thinking refers to conscious, planned attempts to make sense of and change the world. So daydreaming is not thinking because it's not planned. Same thing with dreaming while we're sleeping. It's not a planned thought process. So before we get into how we learn, we're going to talk about how we define intelligence. So we're going to start off with the two-factor theory which measures intelligence through our cognitive abilities. This was developed by Charles Spearman in 1904. The first factor of the two factors is general mental ability, otherwise known as G, which is what different cognitive tasks have in common. Today this is known as your IQ score. This is generally a good indicator of performance in academic areas and certain careers. However, it neglects motor, perceptual, musical, and creative abilities. So it's a very limiting perspective in terms of what skill sets you bring to the table. Now the second factor specifically looks at those mental abilities, i.e. S, such as math, mechanical ability, and verbal skills. So what you'll see here is G in the center and then the S's around it and then you know verbal, mechanical, spatial, numerical. So an artist, for example, may have very good spatial skills, may have good mechanical skills, but may not have in fact a good mathematical sense. So again, what we're looking at here is not just one type of intelligence. Moving on, we have the multiple intelligence theory, which personally this is my favorite. This was developed by Howard Gardner, and he believes that standard IQ tests only measure verbal and logical mathematical intelligence and neglect other important types of intelligence. The main problem with Gardner's approach is that there is, a, there is no way of measuring these various intelligences. He argues that there are nine types of intelligence, verbal, musical, logical, mathematical, spatial, body movement, understanding oneself, understanding others, naturalistic, and existential. And you'll see over here on the chart on the right how they're broken up in terms of whether they're interactive, analytical, or introspective. So to give you an example, let's take somebody like Mozart, who is a genius in terms of musical composition. No one would be able to compare him to somebody like Einstein, who everybody pretty much recognizes as a genius when it comes to mathematics and logic. In the same way, you can compare them to somebody who is like Rudolf Nureyev, who was a ballet artist. He was a ballet dancer who had the most amazing body movement. He could literally hold himself in the air for seconds. And again, the idea here is that each of us have a certain kind of intelligence that is considered a level of genius but we lack that level of genius in other ways. So Howard Gardner gives us the ability to be a genius in one way, but not be such a great um, intellect in other ways, but still feel really good about our abilities. Then we have the triarchic theory, which is by Robert Sternberg, and it defined intelligence by analyzing three kinds of reasoning processes that people use in solving problems. The advantage is that it takes into account street smarts, but not much research has been done because the theory is relatively new. 
analytical or logical thinking skills are measured by traditional IQ tests. And analytical things are like analyze, critique, judge, compare and contrast, evaluate and assess. Problem solving skills require creative thinking and the ability to learn from experience. And these skill sets include creating, inventing, discovering, imagining, supposing and predicting. And finally, the use of practical thinking skills that help a person adjust to and cope with their socio-cultural environment, i.e. their street skills. So you apply, you use, you put into practice, implement, employ, or render practical. So let's kind of look at how we measure intelligence. Early attempts to measure intelligence relied on the size of our brain and our academic performance. They used to weigh the brain. They used to measure the diameter of the brain. Um, but this was not a consistent indicator of intelligence though. And eventually what people realized is that for an IQ test to be effective, it has to have two characteristics. One, it has to be valid. It must measure what it is supposed to measure. And two, it must be reliable. In other words, it has to be consistent through a person's lifetime. So the IQ test that you take as a five-year-old should be fairly consistent, barring any brain trauma or other kinds of problems throughout one's lifetime when you're 50. So, Let's talk about where the idea of IQ tests came from and originally we're going to go right back to about 115 years ago, give or take, which was 1905 with Alfred Binet and Theodore Simon developed the first standardized intelligence test. It measured vocabulary, memory, common knowledge and other cognitive abilities and remember cognitive means thinking. It was developed for the Paris public school system and it was to divide children as either being capable or deficient. If a child was deficient, they were categorized into three subcategories. Now these were real subcategories. Idiots were severe deficiency. Imbeciles had a moderate deficiency and morons had a mild deficiency. I know these words are horrible these days, but keeping in mind that, you know, a hundred plus years ago, these were terms that were considered appropriate in this context. Note, these terms are no longer used in any academic setting. Eventually, Binet and Simon revised their intelligence tests to make them age appropriate. Test items were arranged by age level so this test could identify which average age level the child performed at. For example, if a six-year-old can only answer questions the average three-year-old can answer, then his mental age is three. Corollarily, uh, uh, you know, in a corollary, if a three-year-old can answer questions a six-year-old could answer, then their mental age is six. So it goes both ways. In 1916, Lewis Terman at Stanford University improved upon this mental age idea by creating an equation. The mental age divided by the chronological age of the person divided or multiplied by 100 is their IQ and this is called the ratio IQ and it became known as the Stanford Binet IQ and for years this was the standard. until Weschler came along. Weschler is the standard that is used today and there are two different intelligence scales. The first is for adults. The Weschler Adult Intelligence Scale includes 10 subtests that examine many facets of human intellect including memory. The Weschler Intelligence Scale for Children is given to children ages 6 to 16 and it measures two aspects of intelligence in children. 
verbal and performance intelligence. Verbal intelligence includes aspects like vocabulary and comprehension. Performance intelligence includes matrix reasoning and picture completion. The average intelligence is considered to be an IQ score of 100. In a normal distribution, the IQ range of one standard deviation above and below the mean, i.e. between 85 and 115, is where approximately 68% of all adults around the world would fall. So the vast majority of people on Earth range between 85 and 115 in terms of their intelligence. The four index scores representing major components of intelligence for the adult intelligence scale include the verbal comprehension index, perceptual reasoning index, working memory index, and the processing speed index. Two broad scores are also generated which can be used to summarize general intellectual abilities, the full scale IQ based on the total combined performances of the four index scores and the general ability index based only on the six subtests that comprise the verbal comprehension index and the perceptual reasoning index. Now for those of you who may be curious about your own Weschler scale intelligence, I have included in your um, Moodle experience, a uh, website that you can take a portion of the exam. And again, with everything you do on the internet, you're not taking it in a proper environment, with a proper tester, with a proper mindset. So you want to be very careful about doing these things when you're tired, uh, when you don't have a lot of time, those kind of things. So you want to be careful about um, what the scale says about your intelligence. In other words, you know, if it says that you have a very low IQ, but you do really well in school, don't take that as gospel truth. You know, you have to remember that everything is relative to your context. So some of the potential problems with IQ testing include cultural bias. The wording of the questions and the experience on which the questions are used. If you are somebody who has never experienced what it's like to live in an environment where people have yards and the question is asking you about the area of a yard, that's going to be a completely foreign idea to you. And I know that sounds kind of a minimal issue, but that can be a very significant issue for people whose cultural experiences are much different. It minimizes subjective intelligence. IQ tests minimize the importance of creativity, practical intelligence, character, virtue, and morality. And IQ is not immutable. Depending what, what occurs in our life, our IQ can change, can improve, and it can decline. You know, a five or six year old who goes through trauma um, when they're still in elementary school, their IQ can in fact decline. Um, a child that goes through a process where they go from a traumatic environment to a very productive environment, their IQ can improve. So again, you know, IQ is only part of how we really look at intelligence. So that lends us to the next question, are we born smart? And the corollary, are we born dumb? Researchers have studied how nature, heredity or genetic factors, interacts with nurturing, i.e. environmental factors, in the development of a person's intellectual, emotional, personal, and social abilities. To determine the influence of nature and nurture, researchers use twin studies and adoption studies, which we've talked about in this class before. Fraternal twins, like siblings, brothers and sisters, develop from separate eggs and have about 50% of their genes in common. Identical twins develop from a single egg and thus have identical genes, which means they have 100% of their genes in common. Now, when researchers look at 
IQ studies, what they see is that intelligence is inherited at a rate of about 40 to 60 percent. So it's not exclusively genetic, nor is it exclusively environmental. Adoption studies of identical and fraternal twins separated at birth and raised separately have shown that children with poor educational opportunities and low IQ scores can show an increase in IQ scores when they are adopted into families that provide increased educational opportunities. So you have identical twins that are born, one stays with their biological family, one is adopted out to an upper middle class family and the family member that the the child that stays with its family that has um, not a lot of options in life their family doesn't provide them a lot of opportunities for learning their IQ is not going to improve very much whereas the child who's exposed to a lot of um, opportunities to help improve their IQ in that middle class family can see significant jumps in their IQ and we're going to talk about this in more detail in this PowerPoint in a few minutes. In 2015 the Association for Psychological Science published a meta-analysis of 14 different studies from Europe and the USA and their findings indicated that poverty has a significant impact on intelligence in the USA but does not in Europe, where the social programs provide a more effective safety net for poor people. So essentially what this study is showing is that when there is, when there are programs for the poor that protect children, their IQs do not suffer. Their educational opportunities do not suffer. Whereas in the U.S., because there is such a uh, loathing of social support ideas and safety networks for poor people that the poor do suffer significantly and if you go down south to where you know a huge prevalence of poor people live you see it in the lack of resources that are available to these folks in terms of educational opportunities Many studies, including the one illustrated on the right from the University of Wisconsin in Madison in 2013, have demonstrated that children ages birth to four years old develop less gray matter, i.e. cognitive tissue, if they grow up in poverty. An impoverished environment for children includes poor nutrition and lack of sleep, lack of books and educational toys, parental stress, an unsafe environment, and limited enriching conversation. Without mental stimulation, our neurons and synapses do not grow at the rate that they should. So if you look at the chart, that green line are kids who come from a high socioeconomic status. Mom and dad tend to make good money and they have a lot of gray matter and that's that cognitive tissue that will eventually turn into those neurons and synapses that allow for learning. The blue line is a low socioeconomic status and you'll see there's a significant drop in the amount of gray matter. And what we talk about in an impoverished environment is children are not getting fruit and vegetables they're not getting a good amount of protein. They may be relying exclusively on fast food for their nutrition, which, you know, fast food once in a while is great for kids, but every once in a while is fine. Not every day. They're not on a sleep schedule. You know, your average three-year-old should be sleeping 12 hours a night, but not always because mom and dad may not be educated, if they're poor, on what is appropriate lack of books and educational toys and again um, you know reading to your child having books around giving them educational toys are going to be stimulating their brain when parents are under a lot of stress especially because of money that's going to cause problems an unsafe environment where mom and dad might be causing each other physical abuse 
or there is no conversation, you know, and you see this a lot where the TV is on all day every day, but mom and dad rarely ever speak to the child. The the child is a sponge, but they're not actually interacting. So their um, ability to communicate is not going to be where it should be because they're not creating a dialogue. They're just sitting there like a rock. And that's why you see such a huge difference in intellect between the middle class and upper classes versus the lower socioeconomic status. Other issues that impact our cognitive abilities, mothers who smoke or drank during their pregnancy. You know, we know that this is bad. And um, but we also know that smoking and drinking is an addiction and that it can be very difficult to stop. Complications during birth, you know, high blood pressure, um, preeclampsia, any number of things that are not the mother's fault necessarily, but can happen. Head injuries when the child is young, they fall out of their crib, they fall off the couch. Um, a history of psychiatric problems within the family. 2014, a research study was published in the journal Animal Cells and Systems that a father's drinking habits before the child is even conceived can have a significant impact on the child's brain development. So if daddy's doing headstands on the keg for his whole, you know, 20s, that's probably not going to work out so well for junior. Intellectual disability, and we used to call this mental retardation, but that is not the phrase we use anymore. It was replaced by intellectual disability during President Obama's term in office. This refers to a substantial limitation in present functioning that is characterized by significantly sub-average intellectual functioning along with related limitations in two of ten areas, including communication, self-care, home living, social skills, and safety. So borderline mentally retarded or intellectual disability, I'm using both terms, IQs from 50 to 75, mild to moderate, IQs from 35 to 50, severely or profound, 20 to 40 and these are the folks who are nonverbal who generally cannot take care of themselves at all and are usually institutionalized intellectual disability can be caused by organic issues such as genetics or brain damage or it can be caused by environmental issues such as poverty um, head trauma there can be a number of issues that go on that will result in an intellectual disability and of course there are issues like down syndrome where intellectual disability is part of that condition so how can you help your child become a smarter child and it is often a process of parenting so being emotionally and physically responsive to your child you know, letting them cry it out for a few minutes is okay. Letting them cry it out for hours is not okay. Appropriate play materials and playing with the child, interacting with the child, showing them how things work, but encouraging their independence. Organized activities and a scheduled routine. Children love a good routine. Getting up at a certain time, going to bed at a certain time, taking a bath at a certain time, eating at a certain time. They don't like living like a teenager. They want a routine and they will benefit from it. Communicating with the child even before the child is verbal. You know, reading to the baby when she or he is three months old may seem silly to you, but the child is paying attention. They're learning your voice. They're bonding with you and as the child begins to develop you'll see that your child becomes verbal much sooner than the average child and finally developing a culture within the home that respects education and reading you know if you're not a big reader this is the time where you're gonna have to find a book that you can read while your child is reading his or her book or you read together 
Um, friends of mine were never really big readers. They started reading the Harry Potter books with their kids and discovered how interesting the books were and how much they enjoyed them. So, you know, you may have hated all those books you were stuck reading it when you were a little kid, but as an adult now, they may be better books. And, you know, you find these books that will appeal to both yourself and your children. Society can also do a better job, and this is where your ability to vote for politicians can benefit your child in the long run. So programs such as Head Start have proven very effective in providing preschoolers with intellectual gains. Head Start programs provide opportunities for per poor children that middle class children already get, such as educational toys and scheduled activities. Unfortunately, many of these improvements fade if the child does not continue to receive intellectual stimulation in school or at home as they get older, which again is so important. That's why as a parent, it is your job to figure out how to be intellectually stimulating for your child. You know, if you teach them about animals, that's when you take them to the zoo and you show them where animals you know how they live and what they do and what they eat um, if you see a show on TV about gardening you can show the child how they can garden themselves even by planting um, a small little garden in the backyard or if you live in the city just having a few pots of flowers or plants around the house these are the things that will stimulate your child's sense of curiosity and intellectual growth and that is ultimately how you develop a smarter child. So we're going to move on and start talking about language because language is how we learn most often. Language is a system of symbols or words plus rules that are used to manipulate these symbols. These symbols represent objects, events, and ideas. Now in English we use words, but if you look at Japanese or Chinese they're using symbols. So when we look at the word symbol we also think of you know those letters that we combine to create a word. True language is different from communication systems used by animals by these properties. So when we think of your cat who meows at you in the morning because they want their breakfast, or the dog that barks when somebody knocks on the door, yes, they're communicating, but it's not true language. So language is defined as semanticity. The sounds and signs of language have a specific meaning. Infinite creativity, the capacity to create rather than imitate sentences. So if you have a, um, a one of those uh, birds that will repeat, like a parrot that will repeat sentences, they're not creating language, they're imitating language. Displacement, the capacity to communicate information about events and objects in another time and place. For example, telling the story of a previous generation. So when you're telling your kids about your grandparents, you are communicating information about something that occurred before their time. So can we think without language? We may be able to think in pictures, but that in a sense is still language because remember, pictures are symbols. Linguistic relativity hypothesis was developed by Benjamin Whorf, and although he died in 1941, this hypothesis became very popular in 1956 when his papers were published, and it proposed that language structures the way we perceive the world. So for example, while Americans have three words to identify a camel, which basically, you know, camel, dromedary, and I forget the third one, Arabs have 250 words to identify a camel. The Hanu people of the Philippines use 92 words for rice, depending on whether it is husked, unhusked, and how it is prepared. 
Americans, you know, we have maybe seven words for rice. And in, in a certain way, you can look at it from a sociological point of view and say, the more important something is to a society, the more words we have for it. However, modern researchers have largely rejected Worf's theory, believing that language differ in what types of information they force the speakers to mention when they describe world, the events, and the entities. For example, some languages require you to be more specific about gender than English does. So if you're speaking Spanish or French, um, you're going to use an article that is either based on a feminine noun or a masculine noun or a feminine verb or a masculine verb. English doesn't differentiate those. Whereas English is very specific about verb tense and that is not the same in some of these other languages. So, you know, this idea of language being socially modified can be sought, you know, can be seen as true to a certain extent, but there's also other issues that go into it. Children learn how to speak through observation and imitation. So when you have your baby and she's seven or eight months old and you are desperate for them to start calling you mama and you're saying mama, I'm mama, and you keep saying it over and over and they just go blah, 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 blah. Well, eventually they're going to get to mama. But really what they're doing is they're observing and imitating what noises they hear. They just can't make those actual sounds yet. The psycholinguistic theory proposes that languages learn through the interaction of environmental influences such as parental speech and the inborn tendency to acquire language. Noam Chomsky, who's a famous linguist, if you can call linguists famous, calls this tendency language acquisition device or the LAD. So when you have a baby who is literally a week or two old and they have a wet diaper or they are hungry, they have learned that if they cry or squawk or scream, somebody's going to come and take care of their needs. So this idea of language is something that is almost inborn. They've learned that it'll get somebody's attention. Language learning's most sensitive period begins between 18 and 24 months and lasts until puberty. And this is when neural development for language is at its height. And this is, of course, one of those things where when they say this is when you want to learn a second language, it's because those neural developments are so ready. So it's much easier to learn a second language when you're six or seven years old than when you're 17 and your brain is like, nope, don't want to learn it, can barely learn it, the rules of the language I speak ordinarily. So learning is defined as any relatively permanent change in brain that occurs as a result of practice and experience. And that comes out of your textbook. That's why that's quoted. This definition has three important elements. Learning is a change in behavior, for better or worse. We can learn bad things. It is a change that takes place through practice or experience, but changes due to growth or maturation are not learning. In other words, all those wrinkles we begin to see doesn't mean we have learned anything. And this change in behavior must be relatively permanent and it must last a fairly long time. So when you have learned something for a test and 20 minutes after you've walked out of the exam, it's gone, you haven't actually learned it. So we're going to talk about some of the theories of learning and how learning exists. The first one we're going to talk about is classical conditioning and this is the one that many of us have heard about because of Ivan Pavlov and he started with the idea that there are some things that a dog does not need to learn. For example, dogs don't learn to salivate when they see food. This reflex is hardwired into the dog. 
In behaviorist terms, it is an unconditioned response, i.e. a stimulus response connected that required no learning. So you, uh, if you are a 14-year-old boy and you see a pretty girl walk by, you will have an unconditioned response. You didn't have to learn that you're supposed to like pretty girls. Pavlov showed the existence of the unconditioned response by presenting a dog with a bowl of food and measuring its salivary secretions. However, when Pavlov discovered that any object or event which the dogs learned to associate with that food, such as the lab assistant, would trigger the same response, he realized that he had made an important scientific discovery. In behaviorist terms, the lab assistant was originally a neutral stimulus. It is called neutral because it was intended to produce no response. What had happened was that the neutral stimulus, i.e. the lab assistant, had become associated with an unconditioned stimulus, i.e. the food. In his next experiment, Pavlov used a bell as his neutral stimulus. Whenever he gave food to his dogs, he also rang a bell. After a number of repeats of this procedure, he tried the bell on its own. As you might expect, the bell on its own now caused an increase in salivation. Because this, was res this response was learned or conditioned, it is called a conditioned response. The neutral stimulus has become a conditioned stimulus. Pavlov found that for associations to be made, the two stimuli had to be presented close together in time. He called this the law of temporal contiguity. In the time between the conditioned stimulus, or the bell, and the unconditioned stimulus, the food is too great, then learning will not occur. So the stimulus and the neutral stimulus together, close together, will create a learning activity. Moving on to this handsome fella. B.F. Skinner is the father of operant conditioning and he organized his experiments using these terms. And I gotta tell you, I absolutely love his hairstyle. Neutral operants, which are the responses from the environment that neither increase nor decrease the probability of a behavior being repeated. Reinforcers, which are responses from the environment that increase the probability of a behavior being repeated. Reinforcers can either be positive or negative. And then finally, punishers, responses from the environment that decrease the likelihood of a behavior being repeated. Punishment weakens the behavior. Operant conditioning can be described as a process that attempts to modify behavior through the use of positive and negative reinforcement. Through operant conditioning, an individual makes an association between a particular behavior and its consequence. So reinforcement is any event that strengthens or increases that behavior which it follows. Positive reinforcement strengthens behavior because it provides a reward. So some examples. If you do really well in school and your parents give you money, or a school teacher awards points to those students who participate in class discussions and students eventually realize that when they involuntarily engage in the class dialogue they earn more points. Negative reinforcement strengthens behavior because it stops or removes an unpleasant experience. So an example of negative reinforcement is if you do not complete your homework you give your teacher five dollars. You complete your homework to avoid paying the five dollars to your teacher, th thus strengthening the behavior of completing your homework and saving your own money. Punishment is designed to weaken or eliminate a response rather than increase it. It is an aversive event that decreases the behavior that it follows. Positive punishment occurs when the subject performs an unwanted action, some type of negative outcome, is purposefully applied. 
the concept of positive punishment can be difficult to remember, especially because it seems like a contradiction. The easiest way to remember this concept is to note that it involves an aversive stimulus that is added to the situation. For this reason, positive punishment is sometimes referred to as punishment by application. So for example, you are late one morning, you drive over the speed limit, and as a result you get pulled over by the police and receive a ticket. The ticket being the aversive stimulus and theoretically you will not drive over the speed limit any longer even if you are late. Negative punishment, also known as punishment by removal, occurs when a favorable event or outcome is removed after a behavior occurs. So your child misbehaves and you take away their video game as a way to punish them. So negative punishment is you're taking something away from them. Um, Again, these concepts of operant conditioning is the idea that you have the ability to impact another's behavior depending on the rewards and punishments that you provide depending on the scenario. Finally, we're going to talk about the cognitive developmental approach. And this is a very complicated uh, scenario that we're not going to go into in too much detail, but um, it would be remiss of me to not bring it up. And this is um, the idea of cognitive structures and it's the way our brains allow us to organize and adapt to our world. And it was developed by Jean Piaget. And if you have any interest in becoming a teacher one day, you will know everything you want to know about Piaget and never really thought you wanted to know. As a child grows, their cognition becomes more sophisticated at each stage, represents the child's understanding of reality during that period. We begin with the most concrete concepts, mom, dad, dog, cat, and as we age we develop the ability to understand more abstract ideas. Development from one stage to the next is caused by the accumulation of errors in the child's understanding of their environment and this accumulation eventually requires reorganizing. So we respond to our environment through two methods, assimilation. We modify information and shape it to fit our thinking. So a child may see a cow for the first time and call it a doggy. The child fits the strange animal into their existing understanding of a doggy, which is an animal with four legs and fur. On the other hand, we have accommodation, which is we change our thinking based on information we take in. Accommodation refers to the development of a new concept. So take the same concept as above, but the parent now says, no honey, that's not a doggy, that's a cow. So next cow that comes along the child says cow. The doggy concept has been modified and a new concept has been created. So accommodation is learning. So we have seen that the cow is larger, it may have horns or it has udders and again this child is learning and accommodating its new information. And this doesn't stop at childhood. This goes well into and through our adulthood. So for example, a parent believes that homosexuality is evil and their child who they love tells them that they are gay. An assimilating parent holds on to the existing concept that all homosexuality is evil so now they believe that their child is evil. The accommodating parent changes their concept because now they know, okay, I may have believed up to now that all homosexuals are evil, but my child is someone who I love dearly, so not all homosexuals are evil. The balance between assimilation and accommodation is equilib equilibration or equilibrium, this new cognitive 
equilibrium allows us to both assimilate and accommodate new information. So, when do we stop learning? The thought process is never. People who have made learning a lifelong habit have lower levels of a key protein linked to Alzheimer's disease according to a 2012 study at the University of California at Berkeley. So that's a pretty good reason to keep learning. The Rush Memory and Aging Project conducted in 2012 in Chicago with more than 1,200 elders participating showed that increased cognitive activity in older adults slowed their decline in cognitive function and decreased their risk of mild cognitive impairment. So again, the more you keep your brain active, the less it's likely to go off into, you know, uh, dementia or forgetfulness or those other issues. Finally, in the advanced cognitive training for independent and vital elderly, which is known as active trial, Healthy adults, 65 and older, participated in 10 sessions of memory training, reasoning training, or processing speed training. The sessions improved participants' mental skills in the area in which they were trained, and most of these improvements persisted for 10 years after it was completed. So that's pretty significant when you think that the average lifespan in this country is 78. So you can hold on to your senses, your brain, until literally you are heading out to your final reward, wherever that might be. So that's it for today. If you have any questions, please feel free to text or email us. Otherwise, if you are not in this class, please feel free to leave a comment and we will be happy to get back to you. Have a great day and thank you for listening.